Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're joined by Dr. Elizabeth Newton, astronomer at Dartmouth College, who recently discovered three new worlds around the dwarf star TOI 451. But first, we're going to take a look at a new study showing that water worlds like Earth may be common throughout the galaxy. Next, we take a look at a new image of Venus taken by the Parker Solar Probe that could have implications for planetary science. Finally, we learn about a new study showing microbes under the sea floors of Earth could live off products formed by natural radiation, a finding that could assist in the development of life on other worlds. Rocky planets covered in water may be more common around the Milky Way galaxy than previously believed. Computer simulations of the formation of Earth show that pebbles, roughly a millimeter or so in diameter, may have coalesced together as our planet first started forming. These water-rich pebbles could have brought much of the water we see on Earth today to our nascent world, researchers determined. This would suggest that water worlds like our own may be more common than we thought throughout the galaxy, increasing the chances for the development of life on other worlds. The Parker Solar Probe, designed to study the sun, recently recorded new images of the night side of Venus showing an unusual glow in the Venusian atmosphere and at least one feature on the surface of that world. This was unexpected as the camera, which records images in visible light, should not have been able to see through the clouds to the surface of that world. This suggests that Either this camera is unexpectedly able to see infrared wavelengths of light, or there was a rare break in the clouds of Venus. Either of these results would alter our exploration of the inner solar system. A new study from the University of Rhode Island shows that microorganisms under the seafloor are able to thrive off the products of natural radiation, breaking water apart into hydrogen and oxidants. Sediment within the seafloor raise the production of these products up to 30 times that seen in pure water. These findings suggest life on other worlds might also live off this same process, perhaps even on Mars or Europa. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Today, we're joined by Dr. Elizabeth Newton, astronomer at Dartmouth College, who recently discovered three new worlds and more around the dwarf star TOI 451.
This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Elizabeth Newton. She is an astronomer at Dartmouth College who recently led a team that discovered three previously unknown exoplanets in the TOI 451 star system. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, so uh, what do we know so far about this system and what is it that it tried to do to this particular star? Yeah, so we what we know is that there is uh, one star that's the host to three close orbiting exoplanets. Um, so there are three very hot uh, planets larger than Earth uh, and that's the main planetary system. Uh, what we also know about the system is that there is uh, a kind of a dusty debris disk uh, orbiting farther out than the planets. And then much, much beyond that, we actually think that there's a binary star that also orbits the main star. It's, it's very far out there. Um, and we actually think that that uh, binary star is actually itself a binary star. So it's actually composed of two small red dwarf planets, or two small red dwarf stars. Um, and then the other thing we know about the system is that it's young. And that is the thing that attracted me to the system in the first place. So this star, TOI451, is a member of uh, the Pisces Eridanus stream, which is an association of young stars that all have an age of about 120 million years old. And because TOI451 is part of this stream, we know it also has an age of 120 million years old. And so its planets are also only 120 million years old. Um, and so what this provides us is the opportunity to observe young planets and try to understand how planets uh, evolve over time. That's, that's pretty interesting. So you, know, you talk about this stream and this stream of stars we've seen, you know, stretches over, if I believe, if I'm, if I'm correct, over roughly like 14 constellations. Yep. <laughs> so, how, all right, just short, how did we not see this before? <laughs> yeah, it's, so this stream, like that's, that's the other thing that I thought was so cool about the system was actually the stream itself. So it was only discovered about two years ago. Um, and even though it is only about 400 light years away and it's huge, as you said, it stretches across like a third of the sky. Right. Um, and so the reason we didn't see it is because it is so big. Um, it took data from the Gaia mission, um, which is measuring the positions and motions of stars very precisely. And with that data, uh, uh, Another t a totally independent team, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, so with, um, with that data, uh, a team led by uh, MindGuest uh, was able to actually identify that there was this association that was kind of moving together through space and had um, something of a, you know, a, a physical, uh, um, <laughs> my words are not working so well it's today. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I recommend coffee. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't actually usually drink caffeine, um, but I do have a very tiny Pepsi. <laughs> Did you hear that, Pepsi? Product placement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fun astronomy research. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a long week. It's been a long year. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so with with the data from Gaia, we the, uh, the team was able to identify that there was this this association of stars that were physically associated with each other. Uh, and then it was actually um, another group um, that was able to figure out the age of the association. So at first they thought it was about a billion years old, but then um, a team led by Jason Curtis was able to show using um, the rotation periods of the stars, so how fast they spin, um, that actually the stars were all spinning so fast it was only 120 million years old. Um, and what's really cool actually is that that same data that Jason used to figure out how old uh, the association was, that's the same data that we used to discover the planet. Wow, that's pretty cool. So what, what formed this star? How did it, how did it come in? How did, how, did, how, did, how did this stream of stars form? How did it that's, come Yeah, that's a really end? good question um, that we don't totally know the answer to. Uh, so we know of other young associations like the Pleiades is a, an association that's similar in age. Um, but it's much more compact. And so we do think it formed differently than the Pleiades. So one possibility is that it's like an older version of, um, of like a more diffuse group, like maybe the Skosen um, young association. 
Um, so it's, you know, it's a group of stars that form together out of the same, um, out of probably the same molecular cloud, but just like a bit more diffuse than some of the more, the more famous uh, young associations. Right. And so heading back a little bit closer to this system, you talked about the uh, double, the binary system that is orbiting the main star at 451. Were those known beforehand? Is that something that came out in the new data? Yeah, so that's something that uh, we always try to look for uh, since we do have all this guy data. When we find the planet host, we then add, we then kind of query query this database that's been made publicly available and ask, are there any stars that are moving um, kind of in a way that matches uh, the star that we're considering? And so we're able to see that these two stars were moving um, or this the single well we didn't know if it was binary star this this other companion um, is moving in a way that looks like it's physically bound to to the primary star um, and then appeared a little bit too bright given what its color was and that indicates that it could actually be two stars instead of one star um, and so this was not previously known before um, however actually while we were working uh, there was a paper that came out just about the same time as ours that had that also found that uh, this was a likely uh, co-moving companion or a physically bound companion uh, to that uh, to the planet host. It's really fascinating. So, like, I think probably one of my favorite parts of of this discovery of yours is the uh, is the asteroid belt in that system. I just find that incredibly cool. Um, what, what do we know about it? How big is it? How similar is it to the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter? What makes it different? Yeah. So we know. We know basically nothing about it. Um, we uh, think that it's there because uh, kind of similar to the where we thought why we think that there's two stars there is that um, two stars uh, for this binary companion. So our host star uh, is generally a sun-like star, um, but it appears to be too bright at uh, very far infrared wavelengths um, in archival data from the WISE survey. Uh, and so that's something that happens when you have a cool dusty disk uh, around the star. Um, so basically the main thing that we can say is that it is probably a, a, a distance of around five astronomical units. So it is, does maybe coincidentally uh, happen at about the same distance right. as our asteroid right. belt. Um, and we can say that based off of how bright it is, uh, the, like the wavelengths that it's bright at, which tells us something about the temperature, which tells us something about the distance. Um, so it's we don't know how big it is though, so we can only say that it's at about that distance. Um, I think in terms of comparison to our asteroid belt, um, while we don't know any uh, very, we know very little about the specific um, uh, TOI-451's um, disk, uh, by considering what debris disks around other stars look like, we can, I can tell you that it probably is uh, fairly different from our asteroid belt. Um, so these young, deb these debris disks uh, are actually relatively common around young stars, and they tend to dissipate over time. Um, so TY451's disk is probably a lot dustier um, than ours. Uh, and over time, you know, these the objects that are in it will get ground down and that dust will kind of get expelled out of the planetary system. Um, so by the time it gets to be, you know, a five billion year old system, um, I don't know enough about the evolution of debris disks to say actually whether we might expect it to actually have something like our own asteroid belt or whether it would entirely get blown away. All right, it's pretty interesting. <clears throat> we just actually did a story a couple of days ago on a new paper that came out showing that the rocky planets in our inner solar system may have formed largely from millimeter sized pebbles um, <laughs> of debris, which is pretty, Pretty neat. So when we look at these planets that you discovered, um, one of the neat things about them is that um, they seem to actually be holding on to atmospheres. They could theoretically hold on to atmospheres, whereas their atmospheres could tend to be driven off of a lot of planets that orbit this close to their stars. Tell us a little bit about what we know about the atmospheres, possible atmospheres on these worlds. I hope it's not disappointing that I keep saying we don't know very much. <laughs> I love it, actually. This is my favorite part of science. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what basically all we know right now about the planets is how big they are. So the and and what their orbital periods are. So the three planets are two, three, and four Earth radii, which is very easy to remember. Um, and 
the innermost is the smallest one and the outermost is the largest one. Um, based off of uh, theoretical models of what planets' uh, interior compositions might be, planets that are that large generally do need to have a gaseous envelope. You can't kind of, you can't shove quite that much rock on um, to them. Uh, so we do expect that they would have gaseous envelopes. And I think there is a question, um, especially for the innermost planet, it has an orbital period of only uh, 1.8 days. Uh, so it's orbiting very, very close to its host star. And so it is experiencing, um, like you alluded to, like a lot of high energy radiation from its host star. And so that, that uh, could have a severe impact on uh, mass loss from that planet over time. Um, that is uh, something that um, I'm you know, generally very excited about. Uh, it's something my group works on uh, as well. Um, but we don't know exactly what that, would in, what that would mean for the eventual evolution of this planet. So a lot of this data um, came from the test mission, but you're also able to incorporate some findings from the now defunct Spitzer Space Telescope. Can you tell us what Spitzer brought to this discovery? Yeah, so we, uh, as you said, we identified the planets first in the test data, and then we used Spitzer to help us confirm that the planets were like really planets and not something else. Um, and the reason Spitzer is so, was unfortunately, uh, so great for this, um, there's two reasons. So first, <laughs> uh, um, so first um, is that the pixels are a lot smaller. So TESS is amazing because it observes so much of the sky at once. The downside is that its pixels are like, you know, okay, this is not really how big they are, but like their <laughs> pixels are really big. And Spitzer's pixels are a lot smaller. And that means that you can rule out that the planet, uh, the signals that you're seeing that you're assuming are due to a planet are actually from the star that you think they're from. Um, the second reason is that uh, TESS observes in the optical and Spitzer is in the, uh, in the infrared. And mm -hmm. so many of these uh, false positive scenarios, these like fake planet scenarios, um, would produce a different signal in the optical versus the infrared. So by testing both of these wavelengths, um, you know, a planet should basically have the same radius, um, no matter which of those two wavelengths we observe at. Um, there's an, even an additional benefit. So young stars are very, are highly variable. So they have a lot of spots and that causes um, a lot of variability in their light curves that has nothing to do with planets. Um, and that's uh, significantly diminished when you move into the infrared. And so Spitzer lets you kind of get a, a cleaner look at uh, what the planets look like without all the interference from the star. Hmm. And so what do we know about the star itself? Young stars tend to have more sunspots. And what, what, what do we know from that and from our observa your observations of the star itself? Yeah, so young, uh, young stars, including our sun when it was young, are generally uh, what we call more magnetically active um, than our sun is. So they have stronger global magnetic fields, they have stronger stellar winds, they have more flares, they have more spots. Uh, and so TOI451 is very similar in mass to the sun. And so it is pretty much kind of like a young sun. And it has more flares, more magnetic, uh, more magnetic activity. Um, what we see in the test data in particular is that it has more spots than the sun does. And so um, as uh, stars rotate, the spots come in and out of view. And mm. so um, when the spots are on the side of the star facing us, the star looks a little bit dimmer. And when the spots are on the back side of the star, the star looks a little bit brighter. And so we actually can see the brightness of the star changing as the star rotates on its axis. Um, and so we can see this in the test data for TOI451. Um, the overall uh, variability in the brightness uh, is about uh, 1%. So the total brightness of the star varies um, by 1% over the course of uh, of a single orbit, uh, a single s orbit of the star. Right. Um, and uh, so that tells us, uh, oh, and the period, that tells us the period of the star. So this star is spinning on its axis once every uh, about five days. So it's about five times faster than the sun's uh, rotation period. Um, and so both of those things, the fact that it's got this, um, this uh, large variability uh, and that it's rotating so quickly, both uh, help support the young age of the star. That's pretty cool. And so uh, finally, what sort of 
um, innovations, uh, investigations, and instruments, the three I's, are you looking forward to uh, in the future, you know, um, let's say with web um, in the exploration of this system of exoplanets as well as other exoplanets? Yeah, I think uh, there's some really exciting things that uh, I'm looking forward to for the, for the system. James Webb is definitely one of them, although hopefully we can start those kinds of studies with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, these planets were actually identified uh, by, uh, by another team uh, who ended up working with us. Uh, they picked them out because the planets are really good for atmosphere characterization. So they, they should have a strong signal um, in that respect. And so with the James Webb, hopefully we could learn what the composition of the atmospheres actually is. And that could tell us, um, you know, how does the ultraviolet radiation from the young host star affect atmospheric chemistry? Um, and, uh, and, you know, hopefully that'll help us understand uh, all of the trends that we see around older stars with respect to atmospheric composition. Uh, the other thing that I am really interested in is going back to this question of atmospheric mass loss. And for that, uh, James Webb actually, for the most part, won't help with, with those studies. Um, but, uh, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based telescopes can help us, uh, can provide us with the ability to actually try to observe the evaporation of a planetary atmosphere. And at the same time, uh, theoretical work will help us understand kind of like how all of these processes fit together. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, I guess, both the observational aspect of that and the theoretical aspect. That's, that's pretty cool. And actually, I do have one last quick thing. Uh, you know, you're an astronomer, so of course, you know, you work a lot in physics. And so my question to you is, having a last name Newton, plus or minus in working <laughs> in physics? <laughs> um, I... I guess so I the first time anyone ever mentioned that to me was uh, when I started college. I had not given it a single moment of thought before that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say plus because people do find it amusing. Uh, I did actually change my name when I got married, so I actually have a different legal last name now. But <laughs> <laughs> stay with Newton. It's it's cool. <laughs> yeah, right. it's a uh, it's a fun it's. It's a fun one. I think, you know, I don't know, you could probably go with like Kepler would be a pretty solid one for someone who studies exoplanets. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah. I have not ever met a Kepler. <laughs> ah, there we go. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Elizabeth. It was really a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, it was nice to meet you. It was yeah. a good time being here. All right, super glad to hear it. And that was Dr. Elizabeth Newton, astronomer at Dartmouth College. Join us on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion on March 16th when we will talk with the world's best known astrophysicist, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. The following week, we will talk with physicist Dr. Lauren Kraut, Lawrence Krauss, author of The Physics of Star Trek. Subscribe or follow today and never miss an episode. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show at day before the general public. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, and I hope you did, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or 
thecosmiccompanion.net.